There is a story about five men sitting around a table at breakfast and talking. Their conversation turns to today's depressing news stories. And one of the men suggests that they go around the table and have each person in turn say whether he is an optimist or a pessimist. And to talk about the state of the world as we now see it. As it turns out, four of the five announce, I am a pessimist. How one of them speaks for all. Can we be optimistic when the world is such a mess? Inflation is soaring. Congress is paralyzed. Our country is split angrily down the middle. Gun violence proliferates. And the Russian invasion of the Ukraine roils and destabilizes the world. How in this world of ours can we be optimistic? At this moment, a kind of stunned silence hovers over the table. A few moments later, one of the four turns to the only person around the table who has announced that he is an optimist and asks, so if you're such an optimist, why do you look so worried? To which he replies, do you think it's easy to be an optimist? At this point, I want to be honest with you. Even as I laugh at this response of the optimist, I am also haunted by it. Haunted because it acknowledges in one brilliant stroke two realities about what is wrong with the world and about what is right. On the one hand, it evokes the problematic, often tragic nature of things. The affairs of our country and the world often remind me of the driveway of the house in which I used to live. As soon as I had that driveway resealed, it immediately began to crack and fall apart all over again. Our solutions inevitably are partial and fragile, and they regularly create new problems. And beyond the state of the world, we human beings for ourselves tend toward self-centeredness, envy, anger, vengeance, love of honor and power, self-deception and violence, what Dostoevsky calls the abyss of the self. We are deeply flawed, distracted by passions, and swayed by parochial interests. And so given the nature of things, which this op optimist sees and feels so clearly, why wouldn't he be worried? And yet, and yet, he still insists that he is an optimist. And then in the face of the pessimism of all the others around the table, why? Because his realistic gloom is only one of the two realities that he sees, and it reflects only one of the two parts of himself. To be sure, he sees the world with a cold clarity of reason, a cold clarity that equals the views of the other four. But he also sees and he also embraces what his table mates neither see nor embrace. And that is a picture of a better world, a vision which he grasps and through the, pre the, pr the pr prism of conviction. The world as it is and the world as it can be, and both simultaneously. And here what I want to propose a distinction, an important distinction, I believe, between the optimist and the optimist's distant cousin, the Pollyanna. The Pollyanna 
is persistently cheerful and casts a blind eye toward the ugly realities all around him. The, po the Pollyanna sees only one thing and only in one way, that which is pleasant and positive through the comforting drug of fantasy. But the optimist neither turns away from that which is dreadful, nor does she succumb to it. Now, what lies beyond this dual vision of the optimist? I think I can give the answer in one word, willpower. The optimist insists, and insists is just the right word here, the optimists insist on resisting the all-too-easy pessimism that may come from what we see daily and how many times a day on cable news and in the newspapers. Yet the optimist will never give in to all of this, but rather insists that we can bring about the vision of a better world at home and abroad. In a word, the optimist embraces what I like to call heroic the heroic nevertheless. Over and against this world of ours, which the optimist takes seriously, that's why he's worried, the optimist nevertheless chooses to foreground something better. And so I will now summarize in words what I believe the true optimist feels in her heart. That realism without idealism becomes cynicism. And that idealism without reason becomes fantasy. By insisting on both realism and idealism, the optimism avoids both cynicism and fantasy. And this is exactly the nuanced stand, stance of Judaism, a stance which we find throughout our literature and throughout our practice. Take, for example, the foundational first two chapters of the Bible, episodes which are familiar to all of us. Chapter 1 of Genesis describes a world that is orderly, purposeful, rational, and good. And God saw all the work that God had done and saw that it was very good, the climactic verse of chapter 1. The world in which we live, according to Genesis chapter 1, can support and encourage the flourishing of both nature and of humanity. Chapter 1, in a word, is deeply idealistic. Take a look at it when you have a chance, and you will see for yourselves what I mean. But chapter 2 goes in the other direction and is profoundly, even disturbingly, realistic. In its telling, human beings at first Adam and Eve, though called to tend the garden and to preserve it, quickly fall into self-centeredness and disobedience, and they ruin some of the felicities of the world they have inherited. And the outcome is this, conflicts of all kinds, man and woman against one another, human beings in a struggle with nature, human beings alienated from God. And this series of calamities leads directly to exile from the Garden of Eden and then to the catastrophes of the first full family, Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, who quickly engage in boasting, in envy, in murder, which eventuates in further exile and its terrors. Not a pretty picture, to be sure. And what ensues in the following chapters is increasing violence, 
worldwide disaster, then hubris and an assault against the heavens. The bitterness of that first fruit casts a long shadow over most everything that follows. Genesis 1, optimism and hope. Genesis 2, unblinking realism. A dual vision, a complex vision that calls to us to this very day. A worldview that urges us to resist two dangers to our spirit, a debilitating pessimism and an artless naivete. For the Torah knows that the embrace of pessimism, though often tempting, can easily slide down into cynicism and then from cynicism into despair. While on the other hand, the comforts of naivete can easily slip into gullibility and gullibility into the exploitation of the gullible. Against the trap of one option or the other, the Bible tells us right away in its foundational moments that we must reflect on and embrace both the uh, insights of Genesis chapter 1 and the insights of Genesis chapter 2. Now, sober as it is to me, I have been a rabbi for more than 50 years. And in that half century, I have conducted hundreds of funerals. And so I have read the following passage over and over and over again at the cemetery. And here it is. God is sure our immovable rock. All God's work is upright. Who can say what is it that you do? The eternal governs what is above and what is below, overseeing both the valleys of death and the heights of life. God is sure our immovable rock. Who can say to God, what will you do? You are righteous in your dealings in both death and life, and every soul is in your trust. This passage originates in the biblical book of Deuteronomy and has found its way into our burial service. Now, I hope you can imagine how jarring this reading must be for the mourning family as they watch through their grief the lowering of the casket. And while I'm reading this passage and keeping my eye on the family at the same time, I myself am feeling the raw conflict between the family's acute loss and the confident optimism of all God's work is upright. And I'm feeling this contact, conflict to the very depths of my being and to this very day. But I have also come to feel over the years the very brilliance of this tense just juxtaposition between loss and belief. Not that my empathy for the family has lessened, but I think I have discerned that this juxtaposition is the exact expression of Judaism's combined realism and optimism. Yes, human suffering is real, and we can't wish it away or cover it over with comforting myths or rationalizations. And yet at the same time, we insist that the world is good and that our lives are good. However, some of the awful moments in our lives make this conviction hard to believe. We insist on this conviction. We must insist on this conviction because to risk sinking down into despair 
will harm all that is possible for us in our lives. And perhaps you won't be surprised, those of you who know me a little bit, that I will now cite a comment by Hall of Fame baseball player and former Yankee manager, Joe Torre. Joe Torre's comment is one that I dearly love, and here it is. Baseball is an imperfect game, which has always felt perfect to me. Yes, life is imperfect, and no realist can deny it. And yet, we must act as if, in spite of these imperfections, that life can be perfect. Because the search for perfection, though it is never reachable, makes the belief in and the striving for a better world both possible and imperative. I want to conclude with a wonderful story about his mother by the poet E.E. E. Cummings. And I quote him, quote him from his autobiography. It isn't often that you meet a true heroine. I have the honor of being a true heroine's son. My father and mother were coming up from Cambridge to New Hampshire one day in their newly purchased automobile, an air-cooled Franklin with an ash frame. As they neared the Ossipes, snow fell. My mother was driving, and left to herself, she would never have paused for such a trifle as snow. But as the snow increased, my father made her stop while he got out and wiped the windshield. Then he got in, and she drove on. Some minutes later, a locomotive cut the car in half, killing my father instantly. When two brakemen jumped from the halted train, they saw a, a woman standing, dazed but erect, beside the mangled machine with blood spouting, as the older one said to me, out of her head. One of her hands, the younger added, kept feeling her dress, as if trying to discover why it was wet. These men took my 66-year-old mother by the arms and tried to lead her toward a nearby farmhouse. But she threw them off strode straight to my father's body and directed a group of scared spectators to cover him. When this has been, been done, and only then, she let them lead her away. A day later, my sister and I entered a small darkened room in a country hospital. She was still alive. Why, the head doctor couldn't imagine. She wanted only one thing, to join the person she loved most. He was very near to her, but she could not quite reach him. We spoke, and she recognized our voices. Gradually, her own voice began to understand what its death would mean to these living children of hers. And very gradually, a miracle happened. She decided to live. Decided to live, we must infer, with hope for the future and all the many opportunities the future provides for a rich and fulfilled life. And so, what is required, I believe, what is required of us is a decision, a decision to live, to live fully and well, guided by a resolve to maintain our optimism nevertheless. 
May this be our will. Amen.